Grant us, O oh God, to hear your voice, and in hearing your voice, to love your word, and in loving your word, to do your will. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Begin this morning's sermon, I wanted to ask you to think of someone you know who is really smart. To picture in your mind the first person you think of when you think about someone who is smart. Who is the smartest person that you know or have ever known? Picture that person in your mind. Now I want you to think about someone who is very wise. Picture the wisest person that you know or have ever known. Can you see that person? Good. I'm not sure, but my guess is that you probably pictured two different people. Because while it's certainly possible that the smartest person you know is also the wisest person you know, you more than likely picture two different people because being smart and being wise are not the same thing. Defining smart is fairly easy. Smart people know lots of information. They know the facts. Maybe the rules, the laws, the data, the history, even down to details. Smart people are quick, they are bright, they are knowledgeable. And when you want accurate information, you turn to them. But defining wise is less easy. Wise people may also be smart when it comes to facts and figures, but they also know how the digits and details fit into a bigger and broader picture. They know and understand people and relationships and motivations and inclinations. And they consider consequences and likely outcomes. And especially how people are likely to feel and respond to situations. They also are not only well versed in their own opinions, but they are likely able to articulate clearly and fairly the viewpoints of people they do not agree with. So wise people therefore tend to have good and fair judgment. They discern truths that are behind and beyond the simple facts themselves. Maybe to put it most simply, smart people will always know, and wise people will always understand. Now in the Bible, both testaments have wisdom in them. Wisdom is given the highest regard in both Old and New Testaments. Biblically speaking, wisdom not only comes from God, but is presented as a primary attribute of God. In this morning's reading from Proverbs, God's wisdom is personified as a woman beckoning humans to eat at her feast. Wisdom, therefore, isn't ours to develop, but is God's to give, to feed us in love. According to Proverbs, wisdom is the most cherished of all God's gifts. Now, the role model for wisdom in the Old Testament is, of course, King Solomon. And the story that serves as the prime example of the wisdom that God gave Solomon is that story of two women arguing over the same child. You may remember how the story goes. Two children were born to two mothers. One child tragically dies. But both mothers claim that the surviving child is theirs. And Solomon is the one with charged with resolving the conflict. <clears throat> now, of course, the facts are in dispute. Each mother has a plausible story claiming that the living child is hers. If it were today, DNA testing would give us the smarts to quickly settle such matters. But Solomon had no way to check on the facts. He had to rely on wisdom instead. So Solomon set up a situation in which the child's life was put in jeopardy. He proposes a fair but deadly solution, ordering that the child be cut in two and equally shared between the two mothers. And then he waits to see what happens. Being smart helped Solomon know that someone had to be lying, but wisdom gave Solomon a way to discern who that was. 
Wisdom also, you could say, showed Solomon that motherhood is more than just biology. A real mother, whether biological or not, will always put her child's well-being before her own and will make any sacrifice to save her child from harm. Solomon's answer would always give him the best mother. And so when one woman agrees to his horrible proposal, while the other gives up her claim entirely so that the child may be spared, Solomon has his answer. Give the child to the woman willing to give him up, Solomon says she is his mother. An example about Solomon's wisdom moved beyond the facts and the rules to the realm of understanding and discernment, relationship, purpose, human inclinations, motives, and their consequences. Now in the New Testament, to have wisdom is to know God's will personified, incarnate, and fleshed in the person of Jesus, to feed on Christ as he speaks in John's Gospel today. The wisdom of God that is Christ is also a gift fed to us over time. So biblically speaking, wisdom isn't just good judgment, it is God's judgment. It isn't just a discerning heart, but the discernment of God's heart, having God's spirit, pursuing God's purpose. It includes being smart, knowing the facts of the history of God and sinful humanity, knowing God's law and the facts of God's saving work in Jesus, but it's also more than that. Holy wisdom is also the ability to discern truths that are behind and beyond simple facts of God's commands and laws and whether or not they are being obeyed. It includes knowing people, knowing relationships between people and their history and how that history shapes people and their behavior. So smart people will know what God knows and wants, but wise people will also understand God's ways the holy will and purpose behind the commands, the ongoing mystery that surrounds the unfolding of God's will in the routines of daily life. So again, being smart is good, but being wise is better. Being smart is an accomplishment, but being wise is a gift bestowed by God over time through a wealth of life and faith experience. Therefore, the words wise and old often fit together for a reason. You can correct me later if I'm wrong, but my guess is that the wise person that you pictured at the start of this sermon is probably older than the smart person. Speaking of old, this September I will have been ordained for 43 years. And I know that I have been a much wiser pastor in the last, oh, say, dozen or so years than I ever was before that. It is certainly possible for someone to be wise beyond their years, but most often wisdom is a gift given over a long stretch of time. So while I don't by any means claim to be the wisest or oldest person in this room, I do think that God has blessed me with a good dose of wisdom over the years, born from lots of personal experience, church experience, even more gleaned from the experience and guidance of other wise colleagues and other people. And since those readings encourage us today to dine at wisdom's table, and in our second reading to be wise and not foolish, to turn from evil and do good, to seek peace and pursue it, I thought it would be a good day to offer a few wise words to you good people of St. Paul's, based on what I know, what I've seen and pondered and prayed about. <coughs> now it is summer, so I'll keep it simple and positive and just three quick things. But my words of wisdom for you today is that you will do best as a congregation in the coming weeks and months by practicing three things. First, patience, then empathy, and then an openness to new people and new ways of doing things. Patience, empathy, openness. Now patience, as you may have guessed, is what you will continue to need in your search for your next priest. Wisdom tells me that you and your diocese are doing a good job of discernment so far, but you have a ways to go. Your vestry has done a lot of work in 
developing a profile, describing the kind of leadership you need and the direction your congregation hopes to go in. They've interviewed a couple of candidates have been, who have been recommended. They said no thank you to one of those who came to interview. And then another one that they liked better said no to them. I find that combination to be a healthy sign that everyone in this process is being careful and honest. Because you weren't turned down twice, you don't need to feel like nobody wants to come here. Nor do you need to worry that your vestry is ready to grab at any warm-bodied candidate that shows up. Wise people are guiding you in this process. The Holy Spirit is doing his work, doling out discernment in increments. The process is working as it should. As it should. Patience is what you might need most now. And the second word, then, is empathy. Being alert to the concerns and feelings of others, more than sympathy where you understand them, but empathy is more sharing them, feeling them yourself. And it's something I think you will need in response to the latest surge in COVID cases around the country, particularly among the unvaccinated. Now here, we are a community of mostly vaccinated people in a highly vaccinated part of the country. And we have therefore been able to relax most limitations on being together for worship, even indoors. But thanks to a much more highly contagious variant, we may need in the coming weeks to go back to some of the precautions we were so happy to move beyond. And to do so for the sake of those people who are still at risk. People with compromised immune systems, and especially people with children too young to be vaccinated. A church that wants children needs to be concerned for their families. I notice a few more people each week who are more comfortable wearing masks again than not. Many churches around us are already requiring that. I have returned to wearing one as I distribute communion, wanting everyone to feel safe receiving because I fear contagion but I want others who come close to feel comfortable. And as people under a holy call to look to the interests of others ahead of our own, we'd be wise to communicate by our behavior and expectations that we understand and we are eager that people, especially families with children, would feel safe coming here. And then the third word of wisdom is openness to new people and things, a determinedly welcoming spirit. You may have noticed that this summer we've had a lot of first-time visitors in our worship. It has been great to see those people so warmly welcomed once they have come. But what you may not know more often is that more often than not, that decision to come here followed a visit to our live stream, live streamed and recorded worship service on YouTube, found either through our website or our Facebook page. Now, you and I may be people who have never ever chosen a church that way, but believe me, it has become the norm today. People who are interested in finding a congregation begin by visiting churches' websites and their social media sites. And they sample the services and sermons that are posted there. They look for what a church is doing to serve its neighborhood and world. They're getting to know us a lot about us before they ever visit us. And that's new. Rarely anymore do people care about the denominational label, but they do do their homework about what your church is about. The time when all that was needed to attract people was a sign out front that identified your denomination and your worship time are long gone. Wisdom has taught us that whatever a church can do to improve its online presence is worth it. So along with continuing to welcome people when they come, we need to continue to learn new ways to introduce ourselves to people before they come. So those are the three things. And even though it's maybe more a sampling of wisdom's appetizers than a full feast, those are those words of guidance for me today. 
Patience with a call process. Empathy as a pandemic drags, drags on to another fall and an openness to new ways of telling the Jesus story and inviting people to become a part of by becoming a part of us. And because I'm not the oldest, most experienced, or wisest person here, you no doubt have wisdom of your own to share. So I invite you to feel free to share it in the coming days, either with members of the vestry or with me. Because wisdom is God's gift to all of us. Peace we are invited to join today. <clears throat>